Thank you very much for the invitation, and it's great to present our theoretical work, um, and it's also great to just give essentially the second part to Louis' talk, and in fact, this has been um, a back and forth between experiment and theory going on for almost a decade, and I will uh, dwell more about the control logic that in fact facilitates sperm chemotaxis in marine. So, fitting with the scope of the workshop, the sperm flagellum actually, it's a dual machine. First of all, it's of course the motility apparatus that propels the sperm cell in a liquid. But additionally, it's also a chemical antenna covered by 300,000 surface receptor that bind the chemoattractant released by the egg cells that Lewis um, has introduced. And for navigation, um, it is required that these two aspects, motility and sensing, are tightly integrated in a feedback loop to ensure that really sperm cells go up the gradient. And we have been working on the control logic of this uh, navigation principle and described how navigation along a helical path actually represents an efficient steering strategy. And um, to, to walk you through the logic, I will actually spend some minutes to first explain the simpler case of 2D uh, navigation. So, um, as Lewis pointed out, close to a boundary surface, sperm will localize close to the surface and swim uh, in circles. And we uh, nicely understand the hydrodynamics of swimming. So, for example, this wiggling of the sperm head with the uh, frequency of the flagellar bead stems from counterbalancing um, forces generated by the beating flagellum, and we can use this to calibrate, to test hydrodynamic uh, theories, and with these theories we can, for example, understand why sperm cells swim uh, along circles, and we find a, a linear correlation between the asymmetry of the flagellar bean, a bead depicted here, that's the mean flagellar curvature, and the curvature of the swimming pass, and we find this linear um, relationship both in experiment and in theory. And now the um, important aspect of sperm steering is that this uh, flagellar asymmetry is not a constant property of the flagellar bead, but that sperm cells can dynamically adjust this flagellar asymmetry and thereby change their pass curvature and steer their way. And in a nutshell, the whole idea of um, navigation along curve, curved paths is summarized here. Suppose a cell is swimming along a circular path in a concentration gradient, then the cell will periodically move towards a region with slightly higher concentration and with slightly lower concentration, slightly higher, slightly lower. So due to its active motion, the cell is actually sampling a concentration stimulus from the concentration field that's oscillating, and it oscillates with the frequency of circular swimming. So that's important. There's the information, the spatial information about a spatial gradient becomes encoded in a temporal fashion by these oscillations of the concentration stimulus traced by the cell leading to these oscillations at the frequency of circular swimming. So the first part of the feedback loop that links sensing and motility is this tracing of an oscillatory concentration stimulus. And now Lewis uh, introduced the intricate signaling machinery inside the sperm flagellum that translates this concentration signal, 
this input signal into an output signal, a motor response that changes the shape of the flagellar bead and that changes the curvature of the swimming pass. Um, and we have a mathematical uh, description um, for this and um, for um, that proposed one can actually coarse grain details and just retain key features of the signaling system like adaptation to different stimulus levels and relaxation. And now, once we know the pass curvature of the swimming pass, then it's just um, a geometry problem to compute how the swimming pass will change of the swimming cell. And you see, there's, a, there's in fact a feedback loop that the swimming pass, the motility, defines the input stimulus, which elicits uh, an output, changes the pass curvature, which in turn changes the swimming pass. And let's dwell a bit about how this input, the concentration signal, gives rise to a motor response. I said there's an oscillatory concentration stimulus. Now, this is transduced by the signaling cascade inside the sperm flagellum. But uh, on general grounds, we know if we feed in an oscillatory signal into a signal transducer, what we will get out, most likely, will be an oscillatory signal as well. And that's what happens. So also the curvature of the swimming pass in the theory will oscillate at the frequency of circular swimming. And now the question is, what kind of swimming pass do you get for an oscillating pass curvature. Well, for a constant level of curvature, you know that you just get a perfect circle, but if the curvature, in fact, oscillates, what you get is a drifting circle. So you can work out the mass um, on one page, but we don't need the mass here. Just to give you a feeling, here I draw an oscillation of the curvature and it takes maxima at the right positions. And now look at this swimming pass, which is a drifting circle. You see that here at the red position, it's sort of kinked, so the curvature takes a maximum at this red position. And there's a minimum of the curvature here at this lower position. There's again a maximum here, giving rise to this kink in the swimming pass. And then there's a minimum here again. So um, this Cartoon should give you an impression why an oscillation of the pass curvature gives rise to drifting circles. And these are um, the same drifting circle as Lewis has shown you in uh, his talk. And um, I also plotted here the yellow positions where the curvature signal attains a local maximum. And um, you, these are these um, positions. And you see that there's actually a phase lag between a maximum of the concentration signal and a maximum of the pass curvature. And this represents a latency of the signaling um, system, which is important for steering. And in this particular example, it's one card quarter of the beat period, of the period of circular swimming. And you might ask, what would happen if this latency was um, detuned? And from the theory, we find that actually that you get this drifting circles is uh, a generic consequence of having a pass curvature that oscillates. But then you can ask, do these drifting circles drift into the right direction? And this is directly determined by this latency between the input signal, the concentration signal, and the output, the oscillation of the pass curvature. And we have a simple relationship between the, the latency time of the signaling system and the angle um, beta enclosed between the gradient direction and the drift direction of the swimming circles. And what um, happens is that for a particular uh, value of this latency, we predict that swimming circles drift perfectly up the gradient. Um, if you would detune de this latency to three quarter of a, of a 
period of circular swimming, you would still have the same control logic, you would have the same navigation principle, but by detuning this latency time, theory predict, would predict negative chemotaxis where swimming circles actually drift down um, the gradient. And now we can see what real sperm do, and here is um, an analysis of data recorded by Luis. And there's three things uh, noteworthy. First of all, um, there's uh, a lot of um, sc um, scatter in the biological data. Still, um, it nicely corroborates our theoretical uh, prediction. And I should emphasize, there are no fit parameters at all in this plot. It's just a geometric relationship that's corroborated uh, in the experimental data. The second thing is that um, although there's a lot of cell-cell uh, variability and it's uh, a noisy biological system, most cells fall in this yellow regime and for this yellow regime we predict that drift up the gradient is not perfect. You actually drift with an angle to the gradient direction but this is still a sharp angle smaller than 90 degrees. So in the yellow regime, sperm chemotaxis is not optimal, but it still works. It still gets you up the gradient. And I think this is an um, important um, observation that um, despite the variability in this biological uh, system, still most cells get um, up the gradient. And to, to conclude uh, this part, so sperm measure concentration al continuously while swimming along circular paths, um, and then they adjust their flagellar bead in a precisely timed manner, and we have a nice match of theory and experiment for that. Now, we had this theory already a years, um, some years ago, and the question was, we know, far from boundary surface, sperm swim along helical paths. And nobody knew, how do they navigate along helical paths? So what we did, being theoreticians, was just being bold and say, what if the, exactly the same steering logic that we identified in 2D and that matches experiments would be also used in 3D? So we can use the same link between a concentration stimulus and the path curvature and ask, what happens for a swimmer that moves along a helical path? And now, instead of the drifting circles, we do the geometry and find now helical paths that bend. And they bend in such a way that they align with the gradient uh, direction, um, and they align at a certain rate um, beta that's proportional to the strength um, of the gradient. And then, of course, the, the question was how to test the theory, and this is where Jan and Louis' work um, kicked in. They built this amazing 3D tracking uh, microscope, and here is, um, again, a picture of a helical swimming path of a sperm cell. And you see, again, on, this, on the time scale of the fast flagellar bead, the head is wiggling, and it's essentially wiggling in a plane, and then this plane slowly rotates, giving rise to this helical um, path. And we can understand this um, helical swimming um, from a physical perspective, um, from broken symmetries of the flagellar bead. So what I explained uh, before, if you have a flagellar bead, that it's perfectly flat, it's perfectly lying in a plane, but it has an in-plane asymmetry, then the cell will also swim in a plane, but swim in a circle. So this I explained before. And now consider uh, another um, example bead pattern where the flagellar bead is symmetric, um, however, it, the flagellum is slightly twisted, giving rise to a non-planarity of the flagellar bead. And what's shown here is a side view of the flagellar bead showing that it's non-planar. And in this case, the cell would swim in a plane, but because the bead is non-planar, because the flagellum is twisted, the bead plane would slowly rotate, would slowly roll. 
and giving rise to a swimming path of a twisted ribbon, which is, in fact is observed for some human sperm. And now for the sea urchin sperm, you have both, you have an in-plane asymmetry of the flagellar bead, and the flagellar bead is non-planar, and this gives rise to a cell that swims in a circle in the plane, and then at the same time the plane rotates, and this gives you a helical swimming path, and we can do the hydrodynamics, and in fact, this bead pattern was sort of reverse engineered to exactly match the helical parameters that were measured in the experiments, so we can um, indirectly infer the shape of the 3D flagellar bead that um, gives rise to the right helical swimming path. And now, of course, the question is how do sperm cells steer uh, along helical paths? And uh, Louis already um, showed this beautiful movie of a cell that first swims uh, along a helical path, and then at some point, this light cone is switched on and by this light concentration gradient is sculptured and you see um, compli a complicated um, steering response, a complicated swimming path, which however can be explained, this complex swimming path can be explained by very simple local response rules. And I want to again uh, walk you through this plot. So um, we see that the helical path bends, and we can describe this by having a helix vector and look at it, how it's bending, and of course we are interested how this helix path bends relative to the direction of the concentration gradient. And since we know the concentration field, uh, we know the concentration gradient at each position, um, and therefore at each portion of the path, we can relate the banding of the helix to the local direction of the concentration gradient, and we find indeed that predominantly the helix path aligns, bends in the direction of the concentration gradient, so there's a really deterministic steering responses. And uh, Lewis briefly showed this plot um, before, so what's this? That's a, a cross-correlation between the stimulus that we have reconstructed for the cell, so we know its swimming path, and we know the we have reconstructed the concentration profile um, of the chemotractin, so we know in nanomolar units what is the temporal concentration profile sampled by the cell. We also have the swimming path, so we can reconstruct the path curvature, and then we can compute the cross correlation, we get a nice curve. What does it tell us? Well, this Correlation tells us two things. First of all, this is the cross-correlation which you get if you have two oscillatory signals that are phase-locked. And remember, there was the, the steering principle that we um, proposed for the 2D case that you have oscillations of the concentration stimulus uh, that elicit oscillations of the path curvature. So if you cross-correlate them, you should see the signature of phase-locked oscillations, which is indeed what we see here but we can read out more. From this plot, we can read out the relative phase difference between the input, the concentration signal, and the output, the pass curvature, and this phase lag is nothing but the latency of the signaling system that turns the concentration signal into the steering response, changing the pass curvature. So um, we can read off here um, the, the phase lag between input and output, and we get a value um, of almost um, 170 degrees, which is very close to the theoretical predicted value um, that our theory put forward uh, a few years ago, and that was sort of um, satisfying that this optimal value, um, the theoretical value, indeed is realized in nature. And uh, so to summarize, um, there's, while the cells are swimming along a helical path, it's the same logic, they're still sampling a, a concentration signal that oscillates in time, and it's oscillating at the frequency of helical swimming. And just think of this plot as viewing um, on top of a helix, along the helix axis, and then you get the oscillating signal 
by the same principle, and then there are exactly anti-phase oscillations between the concentration signal and the pass curvature. So this plot is showing nothing but um, this um, cross-correlation curve from the previous slide. And then there was uh, one, one little uh, surprise, and Luis um, touched uh, on this already. So um, we were first pleased that we see all this confirmation of our previous theory, and we understand if the asymmetry of the flagella bead oscillates in time, if you have the specific modulation of the flagella bead pattern, then you get a helical pass that we can compute hydrodynamically, and this helical pass will bend, and this gives the alignment of the helical pass with the concentration uh, gradient. Um, but we see also a second type of response, uh, which has a simple logic, but uh, is, uh, is it's again a modulation of the asymmetry of the flagella bead, but much, much stronger. Um, and this strong modulation of the flagella asymmetry leads to a very rapid bending of the helic pass, really reminiscent of a kink uh, in the pass. So um, we observe in the, in the experiments large amplitude modulation of the flagella asymmetry, which gives rise to sharp um, turns. And here's uh, an experimental um, case where you see um, the top view of a three-dimensional uh, trajectory in color code, again, um, whether the, um, the concentration signal along the swimming path is actually going up, green, or going down, then it's red. And, and you see that first this, the helical path slowly bends and gradually aligns, and actually is, act, everything is fine, and this is explained by our previous theory, but now the, the sperm is in a position where it might just miss the egg. If it just continues like this, it has gone close to the egg, but it will just miss it. Um, and the sperm is already in a situation where it's going down the gradient, where the concentration signal is going down, shown in the shading of red. And in this particular situation, you have this huge um, bending, this rapid bending of the helical pass, um, which we can uh, exper explain as an emergency uh, steering response. So the cells use both. They use this gradual alignment of the helix. And um, in, if they, however, experience that life is getting worse, that they're going down the gradient, about to miss the egg, then they have these rapid turns. And uh, we have now um, full theory, I won't go into the details, where we really model how sperm cells processes this input signal, adjust the shape of the flagella B, then you do the hydrodynamics, know the swimming path, and um, in this theory you get uh, the same type of behavior with gradial helix banding and rapid turns as observed in the experiments, and thereby um, corroborating uh, the, the principle of um, gradial alignment responses that are deterministic and continuous, and on top of this, if life gets worse, respond strongly. And with this, I would like to thank my experimental collaborators very much, and also you for your attention.